Hi, my name is Mary Everett, and I work at the Cape Cod Maritime Museum. If you come and visit us at the museum, we have lots of exhibits about boats, about maritime art, the ocean and the creatures that live in it, and uh, lots and lots of history. So we hope you'll come and see us sometime. But today we are at Books by the Sea in Centerville, and Sally Orchid is going to read us a very interesting book. Today I'm going to share one of my favorite chapter books. It's called Beyond the Bright Sea. It's written by Lauren Walk, who is a local Cape Cod author. My name is Crow. When I was a baby, someone tucked me into an old boat and pushed me out to sea. I washed up on a tiny island, like a seed riding the tide. It was Osh who found me and took me in, who taught me how to put down roots and thrive on both sun and rain and understand what it is to bloom. The island where we found each other was small but strong, anchored by a great pile of black rock that sheltered our cottage, a ramshackle place built from bits of lost ships, nestled on a bed of earth and sea muck alongside a small garden and the skiff that took us wherever our feet could not. We didn't need anything else, not in the beginning. A low tide, we could cross easily to the next island, Cuddyhunk, through shallows strewn with bootlace weed and minnows. At high tide, the cottage sat so close to the risen sea that it felt nearly like a boat itself. For a long time, I was happiest when the water rose and set us apart on our own. So just the two of us decided everything there was to decide. And then one night when I was 12, I saw a fire burning on Penakees, the island where no one ever went. And I decided on my own that it was time to find out where I'd come from and why I'd been sent away. But I didn't understand what I was risking until I nearly lost it. Chapter one. I'll never know for sure when I was born, not exactly. On the morning Osh found me, I was just hours old, but he had no calendar and didn't much care what day it was. So we always marked my birth on whatever midsummer day felt right. The same was true for my other milestones, moments that had nothing to do with calendar like the day Mouse showed up at our door, whiskers thin, and decided the cottage was hers too, much as I had. Or the first time Osh let me take the tiller of our skiff while he sat in the bow and let the sun coddle his face for a while, his back against the mast, the fine spray veiling him in rainbows. Or the ebb tide when a white-sided dolphin stranded on our shore. Osh gone somewhere, and I came back from Cuddyhunk to find her rocking and heaving, her cries baby-like and afraid. I used my bare hands to scoop away the wet sand that stuck her fast. And I grabbed her crescent flukes and tugged, inch by inch until the water lifted her enough so we both slipped back suddenly into the sea. She looked me in the eye as she passed, as if to memorize what I was at that moment, as if to say that I should remember this too, no matter what happened later, none of which had anything to do with calendars. Still, I know I'd lived on that tiny island for eight years before I began to be more than just curious about my name. The dream that woke me, wondering anew about my name, was full of stars and whales blowing in the lyrics of the sea. 
When I opened my eyes, I lay for a moment watching Ash as he stood at the stove, cooking porridge in a scabby pot. I sat up and rubbed the sleep from my eyes. Why is my name Crow? I asked. When Ash stirred the store porridge, the spoon made a sound like a boat being dragged across the beach. I've told you, he said, you were hoarse with crying when you washed up here. You cawed over and over. So I called you Crow. That answer had always been enough for me, but it didn't explain everything. And everything was what I had begun to want. In English, I asked. Ash sometimes spoke in a language I didn't know, the voice like music, especially when he prayed, but also when he painted his pictures of the islands and the sea. When I first asked Ash about it, he said that it was one of the few things he'd kept from life before the island, before me. Even though he did not speak it often, that other tongue flavored his English, so he sounded different from everyone else. Miss Maggie called it his accent, but I thought maybe it was everyone else who had an accent. No, not English at first, he said, but people here speak English, so crow. I stood and stretched the night out of my bones. My arms in the thin morning light looked almost nothing like wings. But when I stepped onto a stool in front of our mirror, just big enough for my face, I could see the resemblance in the curve of my nose, the birthmark of my cheek that looked like a little feather, my hair darker than anyone else's. My dark eyes, my skin, like ashes after six months in the sun. I looked down at my skinny legs, my bony feet. Plenty of other reasons to be called crow besides the way I had once cried. Ash himself had three names. Daniel, what Miss Maggie called him. The painter, what the summer people called him. Ash what I had called him since the time I could make words out loud. His real name was complicated, difficult for a small child to say. Ash was all I'd been able to manage, and Ash was what I called him ever since. I wish I knew what my real name was, I said. For a long moment, Ash was still. What do you mean by real, he said. My real name, the one my parents gave me. Ash was again silent for a while. Then he said, you were brand new when you arrived here. I don't know that you ever had a different name. He scooped some porridge into the bowl. And if you did, I don't know how we'll ever learn what it was. I fetched two spoons. What it is, you mean. When I shrugged, the hair that lay on his shoulders rolled up like night waves. Was, is, will be. He filled the second bowl. It doesn't much matter since you're here now and you have a name. The sound of the porridge thwomping into the crockery the tuck of the wooden spoon against the edge of the bowl made me wonder who had named those things and everything else in the world, including me. I could feel my curiosity strengthening as if it were part of my bones, keeping pace with them as I grew. But more than that, more than simple curiosity, I had a nagging need to know what I didn't know. I wanted to know why there were pearls tucked inside some of the Cuttyhunk oysters, but not others. I wanted to know how the moon could drag the ocean in and out from such a distance when it couldn't stir the milk in Miss Maggie's tea. But I needed to know, 
among other things, why so many of the Curryhunk Islanders stayed away from me as if they were afraid when I was smaller than any of them. I wondered whether it had anything to do with where I'd come from, but that didn't make any sense. What did where have to do with what or who? Something, yes, but not everything. And I needed to know all three. Ash didn't. When I asked questions about pearls or tides, he did his best to answer them. But when I looked beyond our life on the islands, he became the moon itself, bent on tugging me back, as if I were made of sea instead of blood. I came a long, long way to be here, he once said when I asked him about his life before the one he, we shared. As far as I could get from a place where people, where my own brothers, jumped headlong into such terrible fighting that no one could see a thing through that bedlam. And for what? Over what? He shook his head. Over mourning worth the fight, over nothing worth the fight. So I refuse to be one of them. And here I am, and here I'll stay. While I waited for Ash to bring our porridge to the table, I tried to think of another name that suited me well. But I came up with nothing better than Crow, which I already had. And it pleased me that I was named for a bird that was smarter than most, smarter even than some people, so different from the gulls and fish hawks that wheeled and dipped over the island that I felt a certain kinship with the big black birds that drifted over from the mainland like lost kites tipping to and fro in the wind before settling noisily in Miss Maggie's hornbeam tree. They didn't seem to belong on the islands, and sometime I felt like I didn't. But we were islanders nonetheless, no matter what anyone else might think. Ash called me another, another animal names from time to time, cub, kit, mule when I was stubborn, wren when I was good. Now and then he called me a moon cusser too because I liked to scour the shore at night for whatever the tide had brought in. But I did not lure the ships that wrecked off Cuddyhunk. And I was no thief afraid of being moonlit as I searched for lost treasure. I had never cussed the moon. But for the most part, we didn't rely on names. If we were apart, we were far apart, beyond yelling. If we were together, we talked the way people talk when there's no one else. Names didn't matter much. End of chapter one.